So the first question, how can I improve my pronunciation? How can I improve my pronunciation? So here's some of my um, ideas, right? Uh, I, I hope you like them if, if you are... Uh, if you're looking for instant answer, like just take a pill from a doctor, I, I can't give you that. But if you want to do some hard work to improve your pronunciation, here's some of my ideas. So the um, the first one is just through listening. Listen, um, but actively and, and notice the pronunciation of words. So uh, English is quite different to Vietnamese. That they're, they're not from the same family of languages right so english sort of belongs to the european languages um maybe like um, french and spanish and german and uh, dutch i've heard that dutch is the most grammatically similar language to english so um the, the languages come from different families the sounds are quite different and you need to appreciate the differences of sounds between english and Vietnamese so um, I mean one of the differences English has these sort of hard endings like um, here uh, test so I've got a t ending you don't have t endings in Vietnamese it's it, you have soft gentle soft endings so test in Vietnamese is uh, if, if that were a word then you'd probably just say the ending very soft like test test maybe but not test like in english so you've got to um listen and hear words if you're learning new words um listen to it there's there's online dictionaries right where you not only see a word and see the meaning but you can listen to it at the same time i think that's important that when you learn a new word you you learn the pronunciation and unless it's kind of obvious you know if you know best and rest you can guess that test has a similar pronunciation um here's another hard ending mock so mock test i i would think a vietnamese speaker might say mock test mock test and if i'm the uh examiner if i'm the listener i'm thinking that that's not okay i'm i'm having trouble to understand you because I need to hear these hard endings. So start by listening. It's a good way. Listen. Learning new words, listening. Um, you could listen to a sentence and then repeat it. We, we call this um, mirroring. It's just like a mirror when you look into a mirror. Um, so you mirror the speaker. You get a native speaker you like and you listen to a sentence and you repeat. You listen to another sentence and you repeat. So it's called um, mirror, mirroring or, or sometimes shadowing, right? So you're just copying. And the idea is that through this copying, you're, you're not only listening and, and um, uh, getting the right pronunciation through listening, you're actually speaking it and internalizing it. Uh, so, so, and that's one way is through listening. Um, and then... Another great idea that students almost never do is get yourself a speaking partner. Don't be afraid of another Vietnamese speaker. You can still benefit by speaking to another Vietnamese speaker in English, not, not in Vietnamese. Um, and then sometimes students, they're, they're, they're reluctant. They're like, well, I, I don't want another person similar to me. I, I might pick up some bad habits, right? You might get infected, not with the COVID, but with um, some English errors. Yeah, yeah, you might. It's possible. But the, the benefits greatly outweigh that. Gives you a, a chance to practice and somebody to listen to you and maybe tell you, oh, you, you said that word wrong. A and then you help them and then you're listening and you're hearing, oh, you know, your your pronunciation is not good. Uh, you're not saying that word correctly. You're the same as me. Um, so it's, it's a really good idea to have a speaking partner. I, I don't know why, but students are reluctant to do it. 
if you don't want to have a speaking uh, partner, then do it on your own, listening uh, maybe to something. You speak. You could record yourself. You can learn a lot by hearing yourself. I, I can almost guarantee that if you have not ever heard yourself speaking in English, it's not as good as you think. When the first time you hear yourself speak in English, you're, you're going to be shocked. You're gonna be absolutely shocked. Wow, I sound like that. It's terrible. And, and you might feel really bad about yourself, um, but you'll learn a lot. You'll hear, you'll actually get to hear what you sound like and where you're making mistakes. So practice on your own. Speaking's a skill. Practice it. All right? You can, you can do it on your own. A, a lot of people don't think they can practice their speaking on their own, but you can. Yeah, again, you might make some errors and miss them, but that doesn't matter. You'll, you'll learn something. It's the learning that's important. Speaking, yeah, it's really important to join a class. If you can, um, have a teacher. If, if your level's really low, you, you probably want a Vietnamese teacher so they can give you some translation sometimes. Um, if, if your level's quite high, you might want a native teacher that you, you might get benefits from having a native teacher. If, if your level's a bit higher, what sort of level am I talking about? Um, level five and up, I think. If, if you're below a level five, probably better with a Vietnamese teacher because they can explain things to you in your own language. Um, mock tests, I, I have a, um, a, a service where I give you a mock test. I, I run right through all three parts of a test and I have a listen to you. I take notes, I write down notes and um, then at the end of it, we have a discussion. I tell you what your errors are uh, what you need to work on, what things you can do better, um, what things you're already doing well, because probably you're doing some things well already. Um, and, and then I give you uh, written feedback of, uh, of the mistakes and things I want you to work on and a recording. So you have a recording. Uh, sometimes I tell people, you made this mistake. And they say, Oh, no, 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 I, I didn't say that. No, 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 no. So I just tell them, well, listen to the recording. And it's surprising how many times uh, I'm right and they're wrong. They, they did say it. They did say it. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize. They don't realize mistakes that they're making. So th I think those are some effective ways. Um, now, speaking partner, let's just go one more idea for this. Um, another Vietnamese person's fine and you can do it face-to-face, -face. or another idea is to find somebody online. There, there are some websites out there. I, I, I can't match you up, but there are some websites where you can um, meet a person from another country and interact. I think there's one called italki, like I and then talk and then some I at the end. But if you search, you'll find them. It's probably a bit harder. I'd say if you want something quick and easy, another Vietnamese person. Um, all right, so I think that answers that question. So let's just look at the next question and keep typing in questions. I've got sort of four here and then I'm going to take some more. So if you've got questions, um, just let me know them. I'll show you the next one just in case you're having trouble to listen. So how can I use correct grammar while speaking? because I can't form a complete sentence. Um, so I, I have to just think what this question is actually asking. Um, so it, it could be that the person that's asking this question can write a complete sentence. They're able to sit down and compose a complete sentence when writing, when given time. But maybe when speaking, can't do it, just can't think and produce a complete sentence. And, and I understand if that's you. If that's you, you're probably uh, band three or four. A, a five can produce a complete sentence on, on, a, on, a, uh, on an easy sort of everyday topic, can produce a complete sentence. A four probably can. 
a three might struggle a lot. So if, if you're really struggling to do that, you're probably a three. Um, I would say you could write down some sentences. So look at questions in the speak, speaking test, write down an answer, and then speak that out. And practice that way at first. Practice forming the idea in your mind, writing it down, and then speaking it. Of course, that's not going to be okay by the time you take your test, but it's a first step. It's a first step to uh, help you to speak is to maybe write down what you're going to say first. Um, and, and then you could move on from there. Maybe uh, later you could just put key points, a couple of key points that you want to say, and then uh, try to spontaneously. Spont spontaneous is mean just kind of like um, in, in the moment, in the moment without thinking too much. Um Use that point and speak out an answer. So um, that's sort of my idea there. If if the meaning of the question is I, I can't form a complete sentence when speaking or when writing, even when writing, I can't do it. Um, yeah, you you're gonna have to um, you, you're gonna have to take like a very basic book for learning English and just start noticing how to form basic sentence patterns and you probably need some translation you probably need a bilingual book a book that's explaining the sentence in Vietnamese and then you see it in English and, and you want to build up common sort of sentence patterns so for example um, uh, we might have a liking liking question what do you like um, I like apples, I like movies, I like reading. You know, it's a structure. You can learn the structure and then you can just change the sentence depending on the topic. You're going to have to start right down there. Okay, so the people that are listening now, you have different levels. If you're a two or a three, you need a bilingual book to start. If you're a four or above, you should be able to form basic sentences. Uh, spontaneously while speaking and then you can move work from there on getting more complex structures going okay let's move on to number three yeah this is a really good question I'm gonna guess it's part two um, let me just check my messages uh, yeah okay I'm seeing some more questions and and then yeah okay so the next couple are good keep asking questions because we don't have enough yet so if, if you've just joined the stream and you've got a question um now's a great time to ask it if you wait half an hour there'll be more people and more questions and you probably won't get it answered so if if you've joined the stream and you've got a question about the speaking test type in your question okay so number three this is a really good one um if the examiner gives me a topic that i don't know how can i deal with this i'm, I'm presuming it's part two but let me just say if it's if it's part one or part three and the examiner asks you a question like, um, uh, I don't know, like what, what do you think of recycling? Um, you don't have to have an opinion. If, if you don't have an opinion, you can just say something like, well, gosh, that's a tricky question. I've never really thought about that. Sorry, I, I really just have no opinion. This is not a bad answer. Re really, the questions in the test just there to get you speaking right just get to get you speaking the examiner's not looking for knowledge they're looking for language so even just saying you don't have an opinion is, is something you're speaking and that's what the examiner wants you to do but i i think this question is probably about part two because it says gives me a topic so if it's part one i'd be thinking asks me asks me a question but Part two, the examiner hands you a topic, you get a minute to prepare for it, and then you ask to speak for you're asked to speak for one or two minutes, one minute a bit short, one and a half minutes, okay, good. Two minutes even better. But what do you do if you get this topic and you just got no idea? What are you gonna do? So yeah, I do have some ideas with this. Let's look at um Let's look at a real question. Uh, did put one somewhere. Um, I think I put it on. I think I've got one on the PowerPoint slide. So let me just 
show you a question so you can get an idea of what I mean about a difficult topic and then we will uh, look at what can we do um, I just got to think where did I put that I do want to talk about this in the answer gosh I've got to put on my air con till I'm getting hot now um, so uh, Uh, oh, yeah, here it is here. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. A, well, I mean, that would work. That topic would work. Okay. The the question, uh, I'll just have a look on my browser because I, I, I was thinking about this question just before. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Oh, yeah, I'll put it in here. Um so let me show you an example of a question that caused this is a real question uh, it's not currently in the test but it was recently and it gave people a lot of trouble so it says um, describe a wild animal that you have seen so a lot of people did this badly so imagine that the uh, the candidate chooses uh, panda bears uh, lovely big cute fluffy black and white animals with funny looking eyes right so you describe the panda and then maybe say they eat leaves and you know that's about 20 seconds and then that's it what else do you how else do you describe a panda that's it i mean big hands maybe or something there's very little to say about pandas so uh one of the uh suggestions i used to give people is um tell a story don't just talk about the wild animal. Don't just describe the animal. Describe the whole experience of seeing this animal, right? So, um, and, and this story can include multiple aspects. When you're telling your story, um, your story might involve people. Who did you see the animal with? Um, the place, May, maybe you were in a forest so you could describe this forest, tall trees, um, birds flapping around. Uh, maybe you were doing some kind of activity. Maybe you decided to go hiking. Maybe you're going hiking. Maybe um, you could talk about the experience during this story. Maybe it was scary if it was a, uh, a snake or a tiger or a wolf, a fox or some, something, lion, um, even an elephant. That, that could be scary. Elephants can be scary. They're big creatures. Um, maybe you had something. Maybe you had your uh, cell phone. If, if you thought it was cool, maybe you took a couple of photos. So there's sort of these different aspects that you can prepare for. And, and then we come back to the idea of telling a story. Uh, and then um, stories are really useful. Uh, this is sort of an extract from my book. It doesn't really um, show things too uh, graphically. But, but the thing about stories is they have um, sort of beginnings, middle, and end. So if you're describing seeing the wild animal, maybe it's a snake, um, you, you can sort of start off, well, I wanted to go hiking, and so I called up my best friend, Bob, who's a bit of an extrovert and likes going out in groups to exciting places. So you can sort of get the ball rolling. You can you can set the scene. You've got the beginning of your story. Then you might develop the story a bit more and talk about seeing the snake, right? And and then your feeling. How did you feel when you saw it? Were you scared? Did you want to run away, uh, or or did you find it interesting? Wow, cool, a snake, great, fantastic. I wonder if I would die if it bit me. Um, so you can develop the middle of the story a bit and then maybe um, the ending. What happened after this? What happened next in your story? Did you all run away back home? Or um, maybe finally the snake went away and you just kept going on your hike and you could talk about where your hike ended. So I think stories are a really, really useful way of uh, developing answers. And, and then the other 
key thing is thinking about other aspects of the topic. You're, you're not limited to, to describing the animal. You can also describe the people you're with, the place, what you're doing, anything you've got with you. Maybe you had a stick in case the snake, snake was going to strike, or maybe you had a knife. Maybe you had a gun, probably less likely. Uh, and, and then you could just sort of describe the experience and your feeling, how terrifying it was. And and note the first words always describe, and note you're going to be doing a lot of describing. Build up some adjectives. Build up adjectives for talking about these things, for describing places and people and things and activities and experiences. And then you're in good shape. For the for the test now an, another sort of related question as well <clears throat> if the examiner gives me a topic and i don't really like it can i ask for another one no you can't right you can't ask for another topic the topics are supposedly general enough that anyone can answer them so you've just got to do your best you've got to come up with something um also just i've got one other comment um you get uh Here's my question here. You get that this is all the examiners interested in, but you do get these bullet points here as well. And sometimes these are helpful. So what it looked like, so you're describing the snake, where you saw it, so this is the forest or the jungle or something. But you can elaborate a bit more and say there were some coconut trees and I thought about trying to climb up one of those, but then I remember they're actually quite difficult to climb, you know, just tell a story. Um, and then what were you doing? What were you doing before you saw the snake? Maybe you'd sat down to have a rest. Maybe you're eating lunch. What were you eating? T tell me what you're eating. You, you can kind of, you've got to be talking about the animal, the snake or something a bit, but you can go a little bit off topic as well. That's fine. And then feeling, how did you feel about this snake? Was it scary or not? Okay, so I think that answers that one. Um, all right, we'll go to the next question now. Um, all right, yeah, this is a really good one too. Um, just like general ways to improve speaking. What's some, so what I'm going to do now is just give you a whole lot of quick ideas about ways to prepare for your speaking test. And this was kind of my conclusion for the previous uh, live stream that I did that that is available as a video so you can watch that well there's 67 slides that's that the last one was longer so um, here's what I came up with as, as like you you know you've got a test and, and it depends on when right if your tests tomorrow that's going to affect things different than if you've got three months six months a year some of you have got a year I'm sure if, if you're band three and you need band seven, you're going to be studying for a long time. So you need to think about studying effectively and efficiently. Um, all right, so here's my, here's my ideas. Um, so get familiar with the test. Watch YouTube videos. Um, look at samples of past test questions. Get familiar. Start understanding what sort of questions get asked in the test. You'll start to see some similarities. Like part one, there's often questions about um, what do you like, what don't you like, when you were a child, in the future. We've got these sort of typical questions that come out. Part two, um, I, I can divide any of the questions into five things, people, places, things, activities, experiences. So get used to describing those five kinds of things. Build up adjectives for the five things for people. Adjectives, somebody who's shy, introvert, uh, someone who's fun and outgoing, extrovert, idiomatic expression, someone who gets up early, early bird, stays up late, night owl. Build these up. You get a question about a person, you've got your vocabulary. You get a question about a wild animal, you can still talk about your extrovert friend who's an early bird that you went hiking with early in the morning. So this is really important. Get familiar with the tests. 
it's not just English. You're not just, it's, yeah, it's an English test, but every test has its own peculiarities. In IELTS, you've got to have a face-to-face -face speaking test. If you do TOEFL or a lot of the other tests, you're going to speak into microphone. So you better practice that. You better practice speaking to microphone if you're doing those. Um, if your test is coming soon, you can start doing this. Look at actual current questions that are in the test right now. There's websites for these. And... Um, Practice answering them. If you see one that you think's horrible, then practice that one a bit more. Possibly even write out a model answer. Some students do that. But don't write a model answer for every question. That's ridiculous. It's not effective. It's not a good idea. Uh, but you could do some model answers. At least, you know, you could do one for a person, place, thing, activity, experience, so that you can build up that language. Uh, model answers is a good idea, especially part two. Read lots of sample answers, especially if you think, wow, this is a difficult topic. What would I say? Have a look at a model answer. See what um, an expert said. You can find these online. There. Just make sure you get things from reputable sources. Right? If it's a Vietnamese website that's fine and even a Vietnamese speaker that's fine but make sure that their level's high right I, I think you all know we we heard recently in Vietnam some big uh, scandal scandals like some sort of uh, stinky story uh, in Chinese it translates like stinky story I'm not sure in, in Viet, Vietnamese uh, I think Chinese is like chow wen or something chow means stinky so it's like this stinky thing um, so the stinky thing is a lot of um, local teachers a lot of Vietnamese teachers were claiming that they got high band scores in the arts test and then it turns out it wasn't true after all they were lying oh no it's a scandal um, so if you're learning from them maybe if, if they're only a, if you're a five and they're a six well it's it's not very helpful you, you need locals that are band eight that you're confident with um, or, or if you're a low level person and you need bilingual you need a mixture of English and Vietnamese then uh, then a band six might be okay for you but ideally if, if it's model answers uh, band eight would be good um, so we want these model answers even for all three parts of the test look at lots of model answers the, the way to use the model answers too is not just read the question read the answer read the question then think do some thinking yourself how would i answer it and then you thought wow i don't know how i'd answer it then you read and oh wow yeah that's a good way to answer that question you'll learn more of that way don't rush through things i, I sometimes have students and they big smile on their face or you know i read a hundred model answers today well fantastic good for you a hundred model answers what did you learn to me, trying to 100 in a day, that's, that's ridiculous. You didn't learn really anything. It, it would be better to uh, just read three and read them really thoroughly, or five. Um, but also think, reflect, look at the question, how would I answer it? Not sure. Oh, wow, this is a model answer, and this person did a great job. Oh, yeah, I see how to do it now, and now I could probably answer the question myself but instead of talking about a snake because I, I really don't like snakes and I'm scared of them I'm going to talk about a, uh, a panda nice cute cuddly panda and especially because I have a toy panda at home so now oh I can talk about my panda at home and how cute and cuddly it is and how it helps me to sleep at night I, I don't really have a toy panda but I, I think you get my idea um, learn idiomatic expressions. Very, very important if you want to get to band seven. If you don't want to get to band seven, if you just want to get to a six, don't worry about these idiomatic expressions too much. But if you want a seven, you need to use these or something similar to show talent to the examiner. You must show talent to get to seven and above. 
So you need some idiomatic expressions. These are things like I said earlier, early bird, someone who gets up early, night owl, someone who stays up late. So you need to build up idiomatic expressions. How many? Should you buy a book of a thousand? No, don't try and learn a thousand. Um, 20 would be great. 20 that are flexible, that you can use flexibly and well, right? And 100% accurate. They have to be 100% accurate. Well, and a question's just coming in now. I see idiomatic expressions. Where can I learn these? Can you suggest? Yeah, you can go on to um, YouTube. Is, is not bad you, because then um, what I like about YouTube, you can read, you can listen, and you also get some um, visual, some sort of visual, some pictures as well, and, and they can be really helpful with the idiomatic expressions to understand them because understanding idiomatic expressions can be difficult. Why? Because um, if, if you just look at each word in an idiomatic in an idiomatic expression, it doesn't always make sense, right? So you see a group of words, you look each one up in the dictionary, you know each word, and then you're thinking, hmm, that doesn't make sense, right? Because it's an idiomatic expression. So YouTube's really good. Um, then the internet is good. Uh, what else do I want to say on that? I've got some in my book, of course. Um, you don't need a lot, and, and, and you might even pick ones where, like, you you might search not just idiomatic expressions. You might go IELTS idiomatic expressions. That could be useful. There's so much information out there about the IELTS now. And, and then, so that'll be done by an IELTS teacher examiner who has some idea about the types of questions and then the idiomatic expressions that will be useful in the test. Right? We only... We want ones that are useful on the test. And so, yeah, so that, that's a couple of sources. But like I'm saying, don't try and learn too many. Don't try and learn 100 in one day. Um, three in a day would be plenty or 20. Yeah, there, there's another question about idioms. So what's the difference between collocation and phrasal verbs and idioms? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll just put this um, into... Uh, yeah, just since we're talking about this topic, I want to talk about these other things too. Um, okay, so collocations are about words that go together. So um, uh, if we're talking about a person that tall, right? We talk about a person tall, but if we're talking about our our salary, our wages, we don't say I got a tall salary. We say I've got a high salary. Um, so it sort of turns out that we use um, a word like high for something abstract that we can think about, but um, not something that we can see and touch, right? And then we use tall in context and situations where it's something we can actually see, like a tree, a tall tree, not a high tree. Um, so that's collocations. And then um, phrasal verbs are um, kind of often verbs with prepositions like you stand up, you sit down, right? You don't stand down, or, or, although they do use stand down in military context. The army, they say stand down, soldier. So stand down means kind of back off, and back off is another one. You back off, you don't back on, right? You back off, you stand up, you sit down. So these are phrasal verbs. And then... Um, Idioms, let's say idiomatic expressions. Um, an, an idiomatic expression is a group of words that together has some kind of uh, special meaning. Um, so like early bird, we've got the word early and bird, but it's nothing to do with birds. It's, it's somebody who gets up early. So we put words together and they have special meanings. So um, a lot of the phrasal verbs are also idiomatic expressions and um, idiomatic expressions often involve collocation sort of the words that go together but but not always uh, so so they're a little bit different but they overlap some idiomatic expressions are involving collocations and phrasal verbs um, maybe just another 
if I just summarize what the three are, so collocations are words that go together. Um, phrasal verbs involve a verb and another word that kind of go together, that collocates, that is a collocation, but it's between a verb and usually a preposition. And then idiomatic expressions are just special um, lexical items like words, special words that come together that have a special meaning. So those are the meanings. And, and when we're talking about um, getting to seven and above and showing talent, all three of these matter. All three of them matter. Um, collocations are great, but often the examiner's only going to notice if you make a mistake. If you talk about um, a high tree instead of a tall tree, they're going to, or a person that's high, that means they've been uh, doing drugs or something. So um, if you said my father is very high, uh, that sounds like they're on medication, right? Taking medicine. Um, so you should be saying tall if you mean. Uh, if you mean tall and not small. So they're going to notice mistakes. And the same with the phrasal verbs. If you say you need to uh, stand down instead of stand up, they're going to notice. Um, the idiomatic expressions are something that the examiner can really notice. They'll, they'll, they'll notice it because they're less common. And because it's in the grading criteria, it, spe it specifically mentions idiomatic expressions and collocations and are sort of mentioned a little bit phrasal verbs not at all so they're all good they all help your grammar but the idiomatic expressions are the most powerful of the lot but but you should be learning all and you don't want to be making mistakes with any okay um right we've got another question well this one's quite long but let, let's have a look at it Oh, and then I've still got to come back. We'll, we'll go back to the, we'll go back to where I was talking about uh, general ideas for for, uh, for preparing. I haven't forgotten that. Not yet. I might still. Um, so the book. Let's just move this down so we can see the whole question. The book collocation in advance that I'm doing exercise maybe exercises is quite hard to apply. Mm -hmm. How many co-locations per topic that you said you know? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, this is quite a good question. So how many of these things should we be learning? Um, it's, it's quite hard to quantify. Like Often people are asking me, well, well how many mistakes can I make in the test? There's, there's no, it's, it's not that sort of test where you can say uh, you're allowed five mistakes or you must give three co-locations. Um, I'd go for common topics that occur in IELTS. Um, politics is not really a strong topic. Um, economics, maybe. Uh, like, like for me, um, I don't know if I've got this on a slide, what common topics are. Let me just have a quick look. Otherwise, I'm just going to do it off the top of my head, and I might miss one, but I'll get most of them. Yeah, I can't think where. I, I might have it under vocabulary. Let me just see, because I often think of topics under vocabulary. No, it's not in there. But anyway, I can tell you um, what they are. Okay, so common common topics in the IELTS test. Um, part one, and, and so you'd want to learn collocations. To, to do with these common topics. Part one, the first topic is either going to be about your work or study. So those are great topics to be learning and to be learning collocations and maybe idiomatic expressions. Um, work like a dog, work hard. Uh, and then, uh, then I'd, I'd probably, oh, so yeah, work or study and then your home. So, um, you know, to be able to describe your home, the bedroom, the living room, uh, that's, that's important. And then the third one is your, the city you're living in now or the city you're from. So those three topics are really important to learn. And then um, just sort of other general topics. There's a lot of questions about education, health, and this is similar for writing, health, Technology, communication, transport, 
um, the media, the environment, like problems in the environment, recycling, things like that. So those would be the topics that I'd be building up vocabulary for because they're common topics. Something about politics, there's not a lot of questions. Not, not directly. You might be able to talk about it, but they're not. Try and learn too many, uh, five per topic maximum, right? So don't try and learn too many. Focus, focus your learning. It's more effective. And review, lots of review. You won't, like, if you're doing idiomatic expressions, if you try and push 100 into your brain, you'll just forget them. You won't remember. Um, so 20 would be good. 20 that you you practice using them so you remember to use them in your test um, and so they're accurate if you get an idiomatic expression or a collocation or whatever right it indicates you're a seven if you get it wrong it indicates you're a six so if you learn a thousand idiomatic expressions and then three out of five of them that you use in your test are wrong you're only helping yourself to get to six you're not you're not getting to seven for that. It's not okay. All right. So let's come back now to what we were doing before uh, uh, this here about the best way to prepare. So I got up to idiomatic expressions um, and then, yeah, sort of common topics. And th this is regarding maybe fluency and vocabulary. The first word is always describe on your part two card, especially you want to be able to describe people, places, and things because a lot of the topics are about those things. And then, um, even if it's not, even if it's something like describe the wild animal, I suppose an animal's a thing, so you've got that, but um, in your story about it, you're gonna be describing people and places. So people, places, and things, really important to practice describing them and to have language, to build up language. So you, you could have your language for these things too, the, the People, introvert, extrovert, place, quiet, tranquil atmosphere, busy, a lot of hustle and bustle. Right? So build these up and then learn vocabulary for common questions. I've, I've been talking about that already, that, that we know your first topic in part one is either your work, study, your home, or place you're living in or, or grow up in. We know this, so you, you should be prepared for those. It's crazy to go to your test knowing what the first topic is and have not, you know, and, and have not prepared for that topic. That's that's crazy to me. Shouldn't be going for a test. It'd be like going for a driving test and not knowing the road rules or something like that. Okay, so that's some ideas about how to prepare. Um, and then related, um, how to practice. So how are you going to practice, especially speaking, a lot of, People over the years have told me, oh, teacher, I, I can practice my um, listening and reading, but I can't think of any way to practice my speaking. Uh, well, you can. You can practice on your own. Just you, you can go on the Internet. You can find some past or current questions, and you can read the question and then read out your answer. Read it out. I mean, you can just think of it in your brain but better read it out loud. Get somewhere quiet on your own, read it out loud. Maybe record it if you want to listen to it, but you don't have to. Um, so practice on your own, really effective. It's not difficult to organize. Uh, this one's a little bit harder to organize, but try and get yourself a speaking partner. Often um, I've had classes and two friends come to the class and I tell them, you, your friends, you can practice alone and they sort of, look at each other and then back at me and yeah i know it's not going to happen i don't really know why i think it's a great idea i know it's a bit strange to talk to your best friend in english i know it's strange but you just set aside a time um if, if you feel embarrassed to do it out in public like say a coffee shop then don't find somewhere quiet 
Um, even better, even better is uh, what I've had more success with is two people that don't know each other. New class, two people that don't know each other. Okay, I want you to meet outside of the class and try to only speak in English. Right? In class, they've spoken in English, so they're used to speaking in English together. Maybe they've only spoken English together. They've not spoken any uh, Vietnamese together. Um, so it overcomes that barrier. There's this barrier that it feels weird to speak to a Vietnamese person in English. So if, if you've only ever done it that way, it's easier. Um, and then you could get an online speaking partner as a possibility too. Uh, you can get your speaking assessed by a tutor or just get a tutor. Not only that, get, a, get yourself a tutor. Uh, it could be one-on-one -on -one if you want to make quick progress, especially something like pronunciation, one-on-one -on -one could be effective as long as the teacher's good. Um, but you could do it in a group too. Um, it'll be cheaper. And, and often you, you can learn from other people's mistakes. You, you hear somebody else, who I don't think it's pronounced that way, you, oh, that person didn't speak very well and you, and you learn uh, by hearing other people make mistakes and, and you learn from the teacher's correction. The teacher says, we don't say it like this, we say it like this. English is a weird language. It's a really, really strange language uh, because it, it, it's, uh, it's a kind of Frankenstein. It's composed of many other languages. So like an H, like uh, honey, honey, it's H, right? But then we come to another word that starts with H, honest. Where's the H? It's not a honest person. It's an honest person. Why is the H silent? It makes no sense to me. Um, or, or it does, it's because of these uh, different language influences. I think honest probably comes from French or something, and they often don't say the H's. But I, I wonder why have an H if you don't say it, right? And then it, it messes up other things too, because if you've learned articles, you probably learned, well, an A goes with a consonant, right? So A honeybee, a honeybee. Well, what about honest man? Is it a honest man? No, it's an. And why is it an honest man and not a honest man? Because... The rule is not actually the spelling, it's the pronunciation. If it's a vowel pronunciation, we use an. All right. Um, I, I do have some interesting questions coming in. I'm just going to finish these two points because uh, otherwise I might get sidetracked and not answer them. Join a class, really, really important for speaking. Really, if 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 uh, if you're if you need seven and you're about a six, 6.5, maybe you can do it on your own. But... If you're trying to get up um, sort of more than a band, you either need a class or a teacher, like a one-on-one -on -one teacher or join a class. Joining a class can be fun. There's sort of a social aspect to it. I, I guess it's not quite as effective as having like a one-on-one -on -one tutor, but it's cheaper, right? So you've got to consider that too. Uh, oh, yeah, I have a speaking book. Uh, or get another speaking book if, if you don't like mine or if you want another one. Uh, if you're low, if your level is below four, you might need a bilingual book first. Right? You might find my books too hard and you might take a bilingual speaking book first, finish that, and then go on to mine. So I'm not trying to say my book's fantastic for everybody. It's not. If your level's too low, you're going to find it too hard. And I'm actually writing another book at the moment. It'll be finished in a couple of months. And that's aimed at lower level learners because I've realized the books that I've got are not suitable for everybody. They're suitable, they're most suitable for people, I would say, band five and up. And below five, four might be okay if, if your reading's decent. Um, if, if your reading's okay, but just not your speaking, then it'd be fine. But below that, you probably need a bilingual book. So there's some ideas. All right. So let's have a look at, we've got some fresh questions coming in. Um, yeah, so this is a good question. I'm, I'm going to take this one, not because I have a fantastic answer, but more because it's a really common 
typical question. And I, I want to do a few questions that are common that a lot of people ask. So, all right, so this is a common thing. I'm at five. What should I learn to move up to 6.5 in speaking? So, all right, so we should think that uh, what is a level five? Um, there's always four grading criteria. So you might not be a five for everything, right? And, and also, if you took one test, so sometimes people think they take the exam and that's the exact level. The examiner gave me a five, so I must be a five. Yeah, maybe, but you really want to think of it more of as a, a range because the examiner has criteria and then they have to look at that criteria and decide what score to give you. Um, so so what, what can happen then? Um, so someone who's a five could really be maybe a 4.5 to a 5.5 quite easily um, because it depends when you take your test, what questions do you get? Do you get questions that you like? Uh, how are you feeling that day? Are you scared? Are you nervous? Or, or are you feeling confident that day? And did you sleep well? And, and is your brain working well today? Um, and then uh, the examiners. How's the examiner feeling? Was he up? We, we all know the, the foreigners that like to get drunk sometimes. Was he up late last night drinking? And you're the first person they see in the morning and they're half hung over. So there, there's sort of those sort of factors. But, but anyway, let's say someone's a five, they want to get up to 6.5. So, yeah, it is going to vary a bit. Um, I, I find with most Vietnamese, the pronunciation, huge weakness because the languages are so different. So someone who's a five, they're going to have to work a lot on their pronunciation, starting off with making all the sounds. Make sure you can make all the sounds in English correctly. And, and, and then you're, you're really going to need someone to listen to you because... I find Vietnamese having trouble with S and S H, like shopping, could come out as sopping, S O P instead of S H O P, so sopping, and um, and the reverse of that too. So something like um, sock could come out as shop. Uh, sometimes C H and S H getting mixed up. So. There's likely to be a, a lot of work to do on the pronunciation. Um, fluency is probably lower. Uh, it's, it's quite typical that someone could be a five, say, for speaking and a six. For reading, maybe the vocabulary might be quite a bit better. Um, but fluency is probably low, probably not a lot of opportunities. So I, I would imagine that you need to put most of your effort into becoming more fluent and uh, getting all the pronunciation issues sorted out. You, you can't, so 6.5 needs two sevens. So you're going to have to get the fluency and the pronunciation at least to a six. And if you don't get those to a six, kind of forget about it. Um, if the pronunciation's five, it's, it's just unlikely you're going to get a seven somewhere else. Uh, maybe the vocabulary and grammar's good enough. So maybe t a seven for vocabulary, a seven for grammar, and then sixes for fluency and pronunciation. But you've got to get those to at least six. So what, what should you be doing? Um, should, I think, join a class would be the most likely thing. You need, you need a course. You need to be practicing your speaking frequently. You need a teacher to be pointing out what your errors are. You need opportunities to speak so that you're building up the fluency, so that you're getting feedback on mistakes. I'd, I'd be spending a lot of time in class, and then I would be also practicing on my own. A lot of students are willing to go to classes. I've, I've had people that will have a one-on-one -on -one session with me every day, but they're unwilling to do any practice on their own, and that's a shame because you, you can do a lot on your own to supplement what's going on in the classes. I'd be going to class. I'd be, work, I'd be practicing questions on my own. I'd be working on issues that I know I have or that emerge from the classes. Um, so if you know you have some grammatical issues, work on those. If you know you don't have a lot of vocabulary to talk about the environment, start working on that. Start working on your weaknesses.
So that's a few ideas, and, and you can use those points I was just saying to, I mean, it doesn't really matter what your level is, you can use all of those ideas to get from the band you're at now to the band you need. Uh, it'd take quite a lot of work, too, to get from 5 to 6.5. It's probably be thinking, um, I mean, at least six months. If, if you told me you had a month, I'd say this is very, very hard. If you, if you had a month and you were studying full time, and dedicated you might make it but really you're probably looking at sort of more like six months to be ready okay um, let's take another question uh, we're kind of a little bit out of time I'll, I'll do a couple more questions though let's so all right maybe don't ask any more questions now let's let's just I'll, I'll answer two more questions and then we'll stop if you haven't asked a question already don't ask it because I have the um, ability to answer it. So let's have a look at this question 11. Let's just delete everything for now. Um, I want that bigger. Okay, if I use more word forms within one sentence, is there opportunities to enhance vocabulary? Uh, yes. So um, what, what we mean by word forms, we have like nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. Um, I, I'd tie this into paraphrasing. So when we talk about paraphrasing something or, or rephrasing something, there's a few ways we can do it. We can take one word and replace it with another word. So we can take store and say shop, coffee store, coffee shop. So that's one way. Another way is to change the word form. So this is another way to show talent with vocabulary. And you, you could be paraphrasing the examiner. So um, I'll try and give you an example. Um, uh, so, I mean, an example of changing the word form could be like production gets, production noun gets changed to verb um, produce or, or the other way around, produce becomes production. Um, so what's... Uh, I'll try and give you an example, but they're they're hard to do. Uh, oh, um, let's say we have um, easily and easy. This might be like sometimes people confuse easy and easily. So easy is an adjective, and easily is an adverb. So we've got to use them differently, right? So maybe the um, examiner says, um, do you think it's easy to recycle? Then you could reply but change the word form. So yes, I think it can, can be done easily, right? So now we've got, um, now, yeah, so done easily, uh, verb done, adverb easily. So, so we're, we're paraphrasing, we're showing talent that we can take the word easy and change it into uh, an adverb. So, uh, so enhance vocabulary, yeah, and that's a way to get your score up higher. Um, you can do it in the writing test too, by the way. So both the speaking and writing, paraphrasing is great. So change it in another word or changing the word form. So changing something that is easy to something that can be done easily. So it's a great idea, and you can practice it. Practice doing that. 